All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about medication administration now. Um, so I kind of feel like these two lectures are almost in contradiction with each other because I've said, okay, it's not within your role to be administering medications, right? Um, and I'll repeat it. It is, it is not within your role as a radiographer to be administering medications. Uh, but you may be administering contrast, which is considered a medication. I don't understand really how that contradiction works, but it's the contradiction that we live in. So to do that, we need to be thinking about the six rights of medication administration. We'll talk about that. Um, steps used in administration of oral medications. Um, five routes of medication administration, be able to define each. Um, talk about advantages and disadvantages of uh, the three internal routes of medication administration, which you won't probably be doing very often, except for if you're maybe asked to assist with TB testing. Um, we're going to talk about charting a medication, identifying veins suitable for IV injection, how to place an IV, um, what to do with IVs. You'll be working with IVs a lot, right? Um, and then finally, we'll talk about uh, precautions for safe administration of all parenteral medications. So key terms, again, they got cut off, I'm sorry. Um, I would define each of these that are found here in your textbook on 241. Um, the ones that are particularly important uh, that are not on this list are um, isotonic, normal saline, standing order, um, and uh, th those are the significant ones. Okay, again, what is our role in this? So, medication administration becomes our responsibility during contrast uh, imaging. So we may be asking patients to ingest contrast media or we may be actually injecting contrast media and since both those things are controlled within the healthcare system as a medication, IV contrast in particular can cause those idiosyncratic reactions that we referred to. We need to know, understand kind of all things uh, medication. Um, we may be there fulfilling doctor's orders in the administration of an anti-anxiety medication like Valium. So there may be a policy at your facility that says that a technologist is allowed to administer Valium, for example, orally to a patient who has anxiety or who has a epilepsy or seizure disorder prior to IV contrast. So that would be um, dependent on the facility. So knowing that, we need to be familiar with how to check uh, an allergic history, so getting an allergy history for the patient, which we've already kind of talked about getting a patient history. This is just specific to um, prior allergies and how to document that. Preparing medication for administration, verifying patient ID, assisting the physician, for example, while they're administering a medication. How to monitor the patient and then those policies. Okay. Well, how are medication orders given? Um, so, written is, for my money, the best one to go with, right? Uh, that if I have it in the doctor's writing, they've asked me to do CT exam, or it came through the, um, the electronic uh, ordering system, the physician electronic ordering system, for me to do this uh, chest x-ray um, and it's electronically signed by the by the requesting physician then that's your best bet right that's total like total CYA right on a written order um, you're good uh, verbal now we're in a gray area because out of convenience you may be asked to do something right does that hold up in a court of law? No, and in fact, in some states, it's not permitted. Like when I was working in, in Utah at that time, we were not permitted to take any verbal orders for anything x-ray, 
and everyone knew it. They just frequently had to be reminded of it because someone was being the, the cool tech and taking verbal orders, and making everyone else look lame. Please don't be the cool tech. It's not that cool. Um, just follow whatever the policies are or the law for your state, and then everyone can be cool, right? Um, also, some institutions don't permit it, even if the state, state law says nothing about it, so it's a legal gray area. The hospital policy is we don't take verbal orders. So that can be the line. Hospital policy is no verbal orders. Now, standing orders are different. Standing orders are a form of written order, right? And it's just like you might have to dig back a few, a few pages to find it, right? Oh, okay, they've had the standing order since January, right? So it was a written order initially, but it's, it just is repeating uh, for forever and ever and ever. An example of a standing order um, that you may see quite a bit is uh, you're going to have a lot of people in your life now who have robot friends who are following them around. What am I talking about? I'm talking about these little IV injector pumps, right, that follow patients all over the place in the hospital and beep and do annoying things constantly, like a really obnoxious R2-D2 who's really top heavy, right? Um, those robot friends are a standing order for some kind of medication to be given at a certain rate, or perhaps for a rate determined by the patient, like in the case of a pain pump. They can push the button and uh, receive more medication. So that would be an example of standing order that we work with quite a bit. Do I need to discontinue that because I don't see an order for it? No. I mean, common sense says if they came with a robot, they should leave with the robot. With the robots, where it gets confusing is if they do start beeping a lot or whatever, what do you do? And the number one thing is uh, be familiar with the hospital policy and just plug the dang thing in. Like, don't start pushing buttons on the thing unless you've been trained to push buttons on the thing. Most of the time, it's the battery needs to be charged because the batteries, for whatever reason, whoever made all those pumps has not heard about battery technology that powers cell phones, so they have these ridiculous 70s, 1970s batteries in them. All right, the six rights of medication administration, right dose, right medication, right patient, right time, right route, right documentation. That may seem completely obvious, and it is, but believe me, every single one of those has been broken by someone at some point in time, and that's why we have to state the obvious on this. Um, this feels like it comes straight out of nursing land, right? Because in nursing land, they love these lists of things to do. Why? Because we do not need to be creative about this. We need to follow the book, follow the procedure in order to get the right results. So I would memorize these. They will be helpful and life-saving for you in the course of your work. Oh, and one thing I will add. A medication, is, there's some sneaky medications, right? Probably the number one sneaky medicine is oxygen. Oxygen is a medicine that has to have a written order from a physician, right? Just because there's an O2 <laughs> canister on the wall that can make everyone feel better, right, does not mean that every patient who comes into the facility needs to be on oxygen. Not unless they have a physician order, right? I have seen people um, in the middle of a procedure start up oxygen and give the patient a cannula just to help them relax. You just broke all sorts of laws. So just because you've got this oxygen dispenser on the wall doesn't mean it's yours to be used. Yeah? Uh, I was just remembering when we were in one of the previous chapters about patient transfer. When you go get a patient, if they're connected to oxygen, you need to communicate with someone before you disconnect it. Is that correct? Okay. And in fact, that's, that's a really touchy point for us but again, oxygen is definitely one of those sneaky medications. Didn't realize it was really a medicine because it's like everywhere in the hospital, but yes, it is. All right, dosage. Normally, these are listed on the package inserts or whatever. Um, physicians are not necessarily required to prescribe the usual dosage. So um, one thing that we run into quite a bit, it, we may change the dosage of IV contrast or whatever, depending on the patient, um, how their kidneys are functioning, whatever. Um, so anytime that we have a question, we should just verify the order, double check the order prior to proceeding. And I wouldn't worry too much about calculating dosage or anything like that. I've never used any of those things like on page uh, 
to 43, anything like that. All right, but routes of administration. Um, <clears throat> so, um, enteral routes. And I may have misspoken. I was thinking about uh, parenteral routes. But enteral routes are oral, um, anything that we're using to access the gastrointestinal tract, right? Um, so rectal and NG tube, right? Oral, rectal, NG tube. So what are we doing with that? Barium, right? Barium is the number one thing that we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at it on Friday. Um, but we may be asked to administer barium, either have the patient drink it, place it through an NG tube, or um, generally don't place barium through an NG tube, but a water-soluble form of oral contrast through the NG tube. Or we may be doing actual rectal administration through an enema tip, okay? Um, so we'll look more at that on, on Friday. Um, medication inhalation, we don't generally do that, um, but a one person, the one group who does is nuclear medicine. Um, they have different uh, tests that they do where they, they have a patient inhale a substance and then they scan them. Sublingual, things placed under the tongue. The most common uh, form of sublingual medication that we interact with is uh, nitroglycerin or nitro, maybe used to control, um, uh, what is it, heart pain or angina pectoris. Um, and then parenteral stuff like IV injections. Um, one thing to know about using the NG tube is even though it's more reliable and easily controlled, um, it will need to be accessed with a syringe, right? So we're not, even though it looks like we're injecting something through an IV, we're not. We're injecting it through a nasogastric tube, which goes through the nose into the stomach. That's what nasogastric means. So this is a enteral route of, in, of injection, if you will. So we don't do a lot of inhalation stuff, but respiratory does and nuke med does. Um, but those are for ventilation studies, VQ scans, things like that. Topical stuff. This is things uh, often put on a rash or something like that. Um, it could also include things like uh, certain uh, treatments for nicotine, um, as well as certain pain patches and things like that. Um, if you're working with a patient and for whatever reason you need to remove a pain patch, please be aware of how that works and maybe have the patient do it rather than you um, so that there's no, uh, so it's not done incorrectly or that you're not exposed to something through your own skin, right? Definitely use gloves. Sublingual. Um, so this is going to bypass the GI tract and go into the blood system through the mucous membranes in the mouth, right? Um, sublingual literally means in Latin under the tongue and like I mentioned the major one that we work with is a nitroglycerin which is a vasodilator. Parenteral stuff so here's the here's what I was thinking about earlier um, stuff that may be going at the level of the skin or into the muscle right um, as well as things IV. So anything that can cause irritation to the GI tract cannot be absorbed through the GI tract um, or we need a more rapid response we can place through a parenteral route. Um, so uh, these are listed in our, in our textbook. Um, and again, this is one of those things where it's helpful if you've got a little bit of a Latin background. Intradermal, right? is stuff that is just below the surface of the skin. So there is the TB test, right? Just below the surface of the skin. Subcutaneous um, is at a slightly deeper level, and this may be accessed either directly or at a slight 45-degree um, angle. And then intramuscular is at a 90-degree angle to the surface of the skin. So this would be things like placed um, in the gluteus maximus muscle or something like that in the lateral thigh. Um, so. One of the, I have seen questions related to this on practice examinations, and the questions seem to focus on these angulations, right? Um, but there's some common sense here. If I'm trying to access the muscle, the best way to access it is going to be a straight shot, right? It's deep, so I need a straight shot at it. 
Um, if I'm trying to access something that's more superficial, it would make sense for me to go at an angle because I'm trying to act some, that's something that's more superficial and I want to make sure I've only broken the skin, I haven't broken this other layer, right? Um, so if you get a question about it and you're like, oh my goodness, we didn't talk about angles, whatever, um, put on your critical thinking cap and just reason. What is it saying? It's saying, okay, intramuscular, all right, there doesn't need to be anything other than a 90 degree angle for that because it's deep. All right. Anytime we're doing this parenteral stuff, it would make sense to greet the patient, especially if this is the way you're going to be interacting with them for the next five minutes, right? Um, so kind of whatever, greet the patient, get a two patient ID from them. So um, their name and date of birth is a good place to start. Um, select the appropriate injection site, get your hand hygiene going on. Um, clean off that area, um, hold the, tent, the skin taut with the non-dominant hand and it helps to do that right prior to the injection because it can slightly distract them, um, insert the needle at the correct ang angle, etc, etc. We will be doing this as a clinical pass off in the summer of next year, right? So do you really need to know this right now? No. I wanted to go ahead and present it to you. Um, I'm not going to necessarily be testing you on this slide, right? But I just want you to be familiar that there is a procedure to follow here. Um, it's not that different from pretty much any other way that we've interacted with patients up to this point. All right. One thing that's super important, though, because, I mean, you may, you may be like me, and one of the reasons I wanted to have this presentation prior to sending you all out in the clinic is, like, my very first day in clinic, I was stuck doing IVPs, which we don't even do anymore, intravenous pylograms. Um, and I had no clue what a pilogram was. I didn't really even know what intravenous means. Um, and I'm working with patients in this complex situation trying to get pictures of their kidneys, right? That was my first day of clinic. I was like, I, this is completely overwhelming. I don't know what's going on right now. This is crazy. Folks are like, whatever. Um, so I want you to be at least have the heads up on this, right? If you're in a situation like that, just keep your head on your shoulders, right? And remember these basic rules. Um, double check the medication three times. So if the text like, go get this medication, right? And I'll walk to where it is. Go to the selecting container. Okay, I got the right medication. Read it out. While I'm preparing to give the, in the injection, I've got the right medication. Read it out. And then just before whatever injection we're doing. Um, and... Uh, the expiration date is something that I would also check. That's a good rule. I've got it starred here on page uh, 249. Okay. <coughs> IV medications provide the most immediate effect. So things like the uh, intramuscular stuff, we want to delay the effect. If we want something to act right away, we are using an IV route. Um, so this is for emergency medications um, where an immediate response is uh, critical. Uh, we can use it for things like nutrition and chemotherapy. We can use it to hydrate patients um, and uh, as well as for control of pain. And our most common interaction with it is going to be for IV contrast. Oh my goodness, this is just a really terrible print off of a chart and I wouldn't even worry about it. All of this stuff, I am going to say whatever to. Um, just ignore everything on this chart for right now. Now, the, the textbook does a little bit of hair splitting about a couple of things, so I want to show you the first one, and then we'll talk about this one. The first one is this thing here on page 253, a butterfly set, right? I hate these things. They are annoying as the day is long. Some people think they're great, and I think those people are annoying. Um, but they're out there. Um, where I've seen them used most often is in MRI, 
where we don't need to administer all that much contrast. Um, we don't really want to keep an IV in place for whatever reason. But in my opinion, it's just waiting for an accident to happen. And I don't think that it's any more comfortable for a patient to have this butterfly shaped needle sticking out of their arm versus a non butterfly shaped needle, right? Like, I don't think the butterfly shape is comforting, you know? So, um, for the most part, my, my school of thought is get IVs on everybody. Why am I saying get IVs on everybody? If I'm administering something that can cause an idiosyncratic reaction that can result in death, I would much rather have an IV secure on their skin that I could administer medications like the epinephrine or whatever through to counteract that interaction than to be messing around with some cute little butterfly thing. That's my philosophy. So the next thing it kind of splits hairs about is this needleless system. Now I hate this term. I, it sounds like one of those things that was invented by CEOs or marketing executives, right? There's really nothing incredibly needleless about it because the patient still has a freaking catheter stuck in their arm that you introduced with a needle, right? Um, but what this does is it allows for access without using a needle, right? You can just uh, screw the little access point on. So I'll bring one out, I'll show you what these things look like. You'll use them a lot. I generally call them lure locks, because that's who makes them, and that's what pretty much everyone in the hospital calls them, right? Uh, they do not go around saying, well, I need to access the needleless system on the patient's arm. No, they just say, give me their IV, or let me see their IV, right? It gets continuous with the IV catheter. But it is two separate things. There's the IV catheter, and then there's this lure lock that connects to the catheter. And at that point, I no longer need to use a needle to access it. Makes sense? I'll show you an example of it in just a moment. All right. So as though the concerns about IV contrast reactions weren't enough, and we will be talking about them more on Friday, um, there's other things that can go wrong with injections. The, probably the number two thing that can go wrong is extravasation. And extravasation can be pretty bad. Um, so this is leakage of the IV fluids outside of the vessel, generally into the area of the skin around where the injection was supposed to go, right? But not necessarily there. It could happen in other places. How could that happen in other places? Well, here's an example. In CT, I mentioned helpful robots. We use a helpful robot in CT called a power injector. And it's able to inject a whole lot of contrast really quickly, right? Um, the nice thing about these power injectors is I don't have to be out in the scan room injecting a patient while the machine is on, right? And it's doing it at a controlled rate, pretty quick rate. The not nice thing about power injectors is that they're using a lot of power to inject things into someone's body, right? Um, so you're begging for problems. So what kind of problems can happen? Well, I had this little old lady, sweet as the day is long, right? And I had an IV in her arm, right? And her, I asked her to bring her arm up. I start the power injection, right? This isn't funny, Miss. I can say your name on YouTube, but this is not funny. Um, so. As I'm starting the injection, I'm feeling it. It's going into her vein right here. I can feel it. It feels like a garden hose with water running through it, right? That's what you feel is this kind of rattle of fluids, right? Um, I go and initiate the scan. There is nothing. There is no contrast anywhere in her chest. I was like, what? Like, I couldn't figure it out. I ran out to the room. Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. My arm's a little uncomfortable, but I just, maybe it's because it's up, maybe... Can I put my arm down? She puts her arm down. All the contrast is extravasated right here. It was bad. A whole, like 125 milliliters, which is basically a Coke can's worth of Coke, Coca-Cola is now sitting in her arm right here. What happened, right? When she raised her arm, it pinched the vein up here, right? And so it blew right here. I was feeling it run in fine right here at her shoulder, at her elbow, but it blew up here in her shoulder. 
That's the problem with the power injector. Now that was a one-off case. That never happened to me ever again, but it was really bad, and she wound up par losing part of the use of that arm. So it was significant. It was a bad day for me. So um, just be aware that extravasation most commonly happens at the site of injection, but it can happen other places. The best thing you can do is communicate effectively with the patient and know that some of those little old ladies that are as sweet as the day is long are like tougher than freaking Vikings. Like how the heck did that happen and you didn't even say anything? Like that is metal. You know what I mean? Like that is class five brutality, like some Mortal Kombat stuff. Um, all right, so this could also be called infiltration, right? But generally, extravasation is the term most commonly used. Um, infiltration refers to diffusion of the fluid into surrounding tissue, and then extravasation is specifically fluid outside of the vessel, which is where we want it, in the vessel. Painful for most people, except for the sweet little old ladies, and often dangerous condition, right? Um, there has been debate, but I'm glad that this textbook kind of slammed the door on the debate on this one. Um, the best thing to do if you've got an extravasation is to apply cold packs as quickly as possible. Um, and an incident report will need to be filled out. Generally, they'll, they'll document it in some way, like they'll draw around the area, and they'll have to make determinations about whether or not the patient needs to come back to evaluate for things like compartment syndrome or loss of use of a joint or something like that. All right, DCing and IV. You may be asked to do this. Um, now, it is much more easier, like the scripture tells us, to tear down than it is to build up. So, DCing and IV is super easy. Um, all you need to do is get some gloves on, rip the bandage off of their arm as quickly as possible, right? Um, don't kind of don't do the like the nice gentle kind of thing like I'm gonna slowly rip every single air and hair out of your arm now really slowly while I'm talking sweetly to you that doesn't work just rip the thing off um, and then have a sterile two by two available so that as soon as you pull that catheter out straight motion just pull it out you can place a gauze over it and instruct the patient to hold their hand up if they can right it will help stop the blood flow and then bandage it um, so uh, having confidence will increase with experience um, and I actually kind of like what the textbook says about some of this stuff here um, about uh, on page 1 uh, 259 um, this yellow box and also here it says your confidence and, and, and confidence will increase considerably with experience um, you should attempt venipuncture only when you have a reasonable expectation of success. You can palpate a vein. Um, and, if, and then seek experienced help if you're in doubt. Now you will find some technologists are great. They want you, like I loved having students try IVs on me, whatever. And let's go out and try it on a patient, whatever. Um, I can't do that here teaching at the college. I could do that when I was a clinical preceptor. Um, other technologists are jerks about this one and I don't know why because um, I think it's it's helpful if we teach people this so just be aware of the, the policies that are there one of the this is a great rule of thumb I think they stole this from me so it should have a quote Ben Roberts here says if a particular if a particular patient situation is beyond your skill or level or if you've uh, attempted venipuncture on a patient twice unsuccessfully call the IV therapy department and consult another team member I used to tell patients this all the time I do a lot of IVs I've been doing them for X number of years right um, I'm going to try. I'm going to try once. If I can't get it that very first time, I'm going to look and see what else is available. If I feel confident I can get it on the second try, I will attempt it. That's it. I will try twice. After that, I'm going to go get the IV nurse. Right. So I'll let the patient know what I'm up to. If they if they seem anxious, um, most patients they'll just say, "Hey, my name's Ben. Whatever. I've been doing this for quite a while. Which arm do you want me to use?" Right. Um, so having that kind of level of confidence. Now you as a, as a student, you may not be able to uh, say that you've been doing it for X number of years or whatever. Um, just introduce yourself as uh, your name and just say, okay, which arm do you want me to use? <laughs> Go from there. 
And here's an example of what DCing an IV looks like. That's something that y'all can all be doing at this point. If you've been instructed to, if the patient is ready to go. Okay, so some stuff on monitoring IV fluids. And before I jump into it, I am going to rewind just a little bit and go back to this little thing in the textbook on um, extravasation and point out a few things that are worth looking at. To avoid extravasation, what can you do? Well, check for backflow of blood. So if you're uh, prior to doing the injection, in fact, anytime you, before doing a, a contrast injection, it's good to flush some saline through the line so that if there's a medication in that lure lock or in that needleless system that could interact with the contrast and do something funky, you've cleared it out. So flush some saline through the line, but draw back right before you flush it to make sure you've got a good draw that there's, you're still right in the vein, right? Um, immobilize the catheter site. So that just means make sure it's taped down well, it's not flopping around or whatever. Um, and then stop the injection if the patient complains, right? Talk to the patient, make sure they're complaining. Um, and then it also has a discussion of how hot packs used to be recommended for post extravasation, but now we're just talking about cold packs. I think that's uh, important to know. All right. One thing you will definitely be doing from day one if you're at any hospital is monitoring IV fluids, right? Um, and this means that uh, you need to know in advance, the nurse needs to know if the procedure is going to be a lengthy one. Like what is lengthy? I would say longer than 45 minutes. If it's going to be an hour or longer, um, the nurse needs to know that. Again, I said it once, I'll say it again, plug in the pump rather than relying on battery power. Um, watch those IV fluid levels. If they start to drop below a certain level, um, it's, uh, it's time to call nursing services and get it replenished, right? You do not want to have an IV line sit sitting empty. That is just waiting for problems. Uh, like for example, an air embolism, which can kill people. When we're uh, looking at these things, I'm on page 263. Um, the bag that we've hung up there should always be about 8 to 20 inches above the level of the vein, right? So basically just above the level of the vein, about 2 feet above the level of the vein. Um, if it's placed lower, the blood will flow back into the tubing and the patient will think you're an idiot, right? They'll immediately be like, I'm dying and you're a moron, you're killing me. Um, you just need to raise the the bag up and that problem will stop, right? Unless the bag is empty. If the bag is empty, it will backflow into the tubing and again, you'll have that conversation where they think you're an idiot and, and you're killing them, right? But it's not a big deal. Let them know it's not a super big deal. Um, if it's too high, it can cause what's called hydrostatic pressure where there's too much fluids going in and the patient can kind of start to feel waterlogged or um, because they can start to have blood pressure problems, things like that. Um, I like these rules here, though, that are found on page uh, 263, these bullet points, and they're pretty much repeated on the previous slide. And here's just a repeat of that. Um, yeah. All right. If you are asked to uh, work on an injection. Wear gloves, dispose of your syringes and needles in uh, a sharps container, um, use the a needleless system when at all possible, um, follow the rules for a septic technique. Um, most of the Baptist facilities now are prior to accessing the needleless system they're using this little thing it looks like one of those like well half and half containers you get it your, with your coffee at like McDonald's or something you open it up and it's got this some kind of crazy antiseptic inside of it and you clean off the thing with that little half and half container of antiseptic. I don't know. Someone was selling their pants off when they sold that because an alcohol wipe would perfectly suffice. Um, so, but yeah, follow whatever the protocols are there. And again, remember to read the label three times prior to any kind of injection. Um, if for some reason like we draw up lidocaine and we're preparing a sterile tray, we need to make sure that we are labeling each thing that's drawn 
So there'll be a place on the syringe where you would label, um, this is the lidocaine, this is the normal saline, right? So that we don't um, mix up our drugs. Um, and then uh, getting the history for allergies and then watching for any side effects. Now, anytime we have assisted with uh, a medication injection or uh, worked with a patient and gave them uh, IV contrast or oral contrast, we need to chart that. Um, so whoever oversaw the introduction of that drug, whether it was an enteral route, like we instructed the patient to drink barium prior to showing up, or we injected IV contrast while they were present with us, that individual, the person that did that, needs to chart it, right? I say that because if a physician, if you were assisting a physician, and they administered lidocaine, they need to chart it. They're the ones who administered it. I witnessed it, but they are the ones who administered it. Um, so whoever did it needs to chart it. Um, and this is what we need. We need the date, the time of day, in that kind of weird, uh, what is it, military time, right, just to be cool. Um, drug name, dosage, and the route, right? So today's day at what, 10.35, I administered IV contrast, 100 milliliters of it through the IV, and the patient's left on. Then I would sign or initial that, or electronically sign it if it's an electronic system. Um, and the same is true for IV contrast. All right, that is it on this.